Did you notice where all the pictures came from? D groups. How many of you were in a D group this past week? Awesome. Praise the Lord. You still can get in a D group. You can do that anytime you want to do that. You might have a friend or a neighbor that's in one. You can join in with them. Or if you're not sure who to contact about being involved in one, go to the fireside room today, the big room right out here to my left. Pink sheets are for the ladies' D groups. Blue sheets are for the men's D groups. Miss Mantooth, I heard we even got one at Macadory Elementary School now. How about that? Fantastic. We got D groups happening in workplaces. Blue Cross Blue Shield, I think, has a D group. If anybody works there, we've got schools having D groups. We had 53 D groups that met last week. So some of them shot off like a rocket, and some of them a little slow coming out of the gate. Don't be discouraged. Hang in there. Uh, we're, we're in this for the long haul. So we are thankful for that and all that that's doing for our fellowship and for our, our growth in God's Word and His grace. We're thankful you're here this morning on this Labor. Labor Day weekend. Are you thankful to be here? Is there somewhere else you'd rather be this weekend? Mm, okay, all right. Well, I'm glad you're here. I really am. And we're going to have a good day in the Lord today. Uh, let me share just a few things with you this morning. First of all, if you're new to Grace Life today and you would like to get some more information or maybe we uh, could help you somehow, we'd love to do that. There's a green tearaway tab on our worship guide here. If you want to give us a way that we could contact you, we would be happy to do that. You'll also find all of our pastor's email addresses in there. If you'd like to contact us, we'll help you any way that we can. And listen, if you're a part of our church family already, but you're not going to be able to stick around for Sunday school in the next hour, I need you to do me a big, big favor, please. Put your name, that's all, on this green tab. That's all you got to do. Now, I'd rather you go to Sunday school, but if you're not going to today, put your name on the green tab and drop that in the offering plate. Why am I telling you that? Because we try to shepherd our people. We try to love them. We don't want anybody just kind of slowly sort of fading away. And so this helps us know that you're here today. And it's a challenge today because there's going to be more people absent today probably than normal. So you will bless your pastors if you'll help us out with that. Would you? No, just go to Sunday school, all right? <laughs> Set you up, didn't I? All right. Um, don't forget, this Saturday is the Hearts and Hands Orphan Craft Fair at McAdory Elementary School. There's some information about that on the back of your worship guide. There's also some information there. Our church conference, quarterly conference, is next Sunday night at 7 o'clock. Let me tell you, too, one of the things that we'll be voting on next Sunday night is a church constitution. Our church has never had a constitution. We've had a set of bylaws, but never a constitution. And so you guys asked a team of people in the church to write a church constitution. Constitution. They've done that. They presented that at the previous church conference for people to look at and to review. But I know many of you weren't able to be there at that meeting. So if you'd like to see that proposed church constitution, we're going to work on getting that on our website this week, yourgracelife.com. So you can log on and check it out there. Or if you want to come by the church office this week and pick up a copy, we'll, we'll be glad to help you out with that as well. Okay. Uh, also, on the back of your worship guide, get your children and students. Students signed up for Made to Worship. That's rolling out really soon. Pumpkin Patch is just around the corner. And as always, we appreciate your serving and volunteering in that ministry. You can get more information today in the Fireside Room about that and sign on to be a part of that. And also the annual Save a Life dinner, the fundraising dinner they do every year. is coming up on September the 21st. That's a Monday night at North Highlands Baptist Church. Love for you guys to go and have a great dinner for a great cause. You can get information in the Fireside Room about that today as well. Well, let's stand together. And let's go to the Lord in prayer today. I do know we got a lot of folks traveling and, and spending some family time, and we're thankful for that. Um, we, we got in late last night. We got to go support one of our church families, the Briggs family. Their son, Braden, was playing in his first college football game yesterday down at, uh, against the University of South Alabama. And uh, they didn't fare too well. Braden's team didn't. I think Taylor's team came up about a field goal. Shh. Sure, but you're here today. You're here today. Mama, Mama's here today, worshiping the Lord, so we're thankful. Um, so we're proud of all of our college students that are uh, serving as missionaries on campuses all over. So you continue to lift them up and pray for them. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer together today. Lord, we want to thank you uh, that it is, it is a, a special weekend in our country. And Lord, that gives us some opportunities, God, to, to break from some routines and 
maybe get to spend some time uh, resting, uh, spend some time with our families. Those are good things, and we want to thank you first and foremost for those. Uh, thank you, God, for these here today. And, and Lord, um, while we need to rest and we need to step away, of this I'm sure you don't. And so you're here today. And God, I believe that you are here today to speak to our hearts and to challenge our lives. God, to give us comfort, to give us healing, to give us direction. Perhaps most of all, to give us salvation through your son, Jesus. Now, Lord, I want to thank you that um, you've not stepped into this room today half-heartedly, but you're all here, Holy Spirit. We thank you for that. And will we... I pray you just work in our hearts in such a way that we would know your presence in this place and in our lives and that we would be refreshed and renewed today. You just come, Spirit of God, and have your way among us in this place. Uh, God, just uh, you feel free to mess up this service today uh, in any way that you see fit because we know you're good and we know that you know what we need most and you know what's best for us. And so we yield ourselves to you today, grateful that we're here together uh, to meet with you. And so thank you right now for all that you're going to do today for our good and for your glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. As we're singing together this morning, I just want us to be thinking about the fact that we're not um, just singing by ourselves here. We're joining with uh, creation. We're joining with with. Uh, creatures in heaven that are seeing the same thing that are seeing that that he is holy that he is worthy that he is set apart and i want us to think on that this morning as we're singing let's think on the lord here we go turn turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside the sound Love of ours will rise. 
so rescuing oh how infinitely sweet this great love that has redeemed as one we see
and the Yarboroughs to come and to join me here on the platform, if they would. Last, uh, this past July, you guys as a church family nominated a, a number of men that you felt would serve well in the church as deacons, and uh, then you affirmed those uh, men in August, and um, this is Mike Yarborough and his wife Michelle, Lee Craft, his wife Sissy. Mike and Lee are two that you guys nominated, and uh, affirmed that you would like to see serve as deacons, and they've never served before uh, as deacons in the Lord's Church. And so our deacons met with them, and our pastors, our some of our ordained guys, several weeks ago. And uh, today, recommend to you, Grace Life, that we move forward with ordaining these two men into the deacon ministry at Grace Life. So if you rejoice with us in that this morning, would you say amen? And I want to invite our ordained fellas and, and maybe some of your wives too if you'd like to come because we got the wives here. Y'all step over here to the middle so we can kind of get around you and step up just a little bit. And we're going to huddle around you and lay hands on you. We want to pray for you today. Roy, I'm going to get you to pray for us in just a second, if you don't mind. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for these men, Lord, and the opportunity to serve with them, Father. Lord, we pray a hedge of protection around them and their family. Lord, and we pray that everything we do glorifies you. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity you've given me to work with this church and to serve you, Father. Lord, and we just pray right now, Father, Lord, that as we go forward, Lord, that we will serve our widows, serve our pastors, Lord, and we will be a support group to this church, Lord, Lord, and that uh, we are open and available at all times, Lord. Lord, I thank you for Lee, I thank you for Mike, Lord, and the men that they are, Lord, and we just thank you for their wise father and, and what they represent. Lord, and I thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, 
you are the reason that we're here, Father. Lord, and we just pray just in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And Mike and Leah, I have Bibles and certificates for you. I'm going to hang on to these, and I'll give them to you in the next hour. How about that? We'll, we'll do this again. Amen. Thank you, guys. And while these folks are moving back to their seat, let me have Grace Life's up-and-coming leaders. Let's have our children come and join me here on the platform this morning. Man, if you could see all the stuff I got down here on the front row today. Goodness gracious. How are you guys this morning? Good. Did y'all watch football yesterday? You did? Who'd you pull for? <laughs> Bless y'all's hearts. Okay. Hey, listen, um, Pastor Saint, here's what we're going to do today, something a little bit different. Pastor Saint has been talking to our pastors for a while now, and some of you that were here for Fam Jam remember that that night while Pastor Saint was talking, do y'all remember that? Pastor Bryant kept walking behind him and picking up a plastic ball and moving that plastic ball into another bucket. Anybody remember that when he was doing that? And I had like half a dozen of y'all that came up afterwards and said, what was that? What was he doing? Well, well today we're going to tell you this is what Pastor Saint's been talking to us about. This jar up here has a bunch of plastic balls in them. Can you guess how many? Twelve. Little? Maybe, tw maybe 30? More. 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 A little more. Not quite 60. A little lower than 53. 52. All right, here you go. You win. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, here's what you do win, though. Come here. You can get one out. Watch out. There might be something in there. There you go. Did you get blue because you're an Auburn fan? Huh? Yeah? All right, cool. So now how many balls are in here? 51. Now, do you know why we put 52 balls in here? Does anybody know how many weeks are in a year? Hmm. 52. Good guess. <laughs> There's 52 weeks in a year. You know, Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, this is how it reads. It says, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, I, I think when we live our lives without any sense of time and how precious it is, we, we tend to live foolishly. You know, we tend to begin to put things uh, in our lives ahead of what's most important. You know, we start to kind of live for maybe what's just temporary. And so God wants us to be mindful of how precious this gift that he's given us called time is. Now, I know just watching y'all, you're like, yeah, we don't care, whatever, we, you know, because as kids... Time doesn't really register with us too much. But for the rest of us, I think what we're going to be doing every week uh, for the remainder of this year is we're going to have a child come up and take a ball out of our bucket just to remind us weekly. And man, we have a precious gift uh, as God's people on this planet. Of course, we know none of us are promised tomorrow. We know that. We know that life is just a vapor. But nevertheless, if God gives us 52 weeks this year... How are we going to use those 52 weeks? If God will give us 365 days over the course of the next year, how are we going to use those 365 days? So I, my hope and prayer is that every Sunday as a child comes up and takes a ball out of our bucket, it will just speak to our hearts that, Lord, would you teach us to number our days? That I might not walk foolishly with the time that you've given me, but I would walk in wisdom and I would use the days well for your glory. Um, and, and moms and dads, our time's moving quick. Amen. Amen. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, we, we'll have an image on the screen next week that will we'll, it'll keep up. It's kind of a countdown clock of how much time is left in the next 52 weeks, you know. And, uh, and some of you raised your children and your grandchildren are getting on up there. Some of us are in the process of that. Um, you'll see next week it'll say 51 weeks left. Well, you know, I've got an 11th grader. So that means I've got under 100 weeks left to have him under my roof before he goes off to school somewhere. 
And that's counting down fast. It's getting really fast. So we want God to give us a sense of how precious this gift of time is so that we'll use it well. So I want you guys to take every day that God gives you and use it for Him. And tell people about Jesus and love God and worship God and enjoy Him. Sound good? Awesome. Well, let's invite Brother Phil to come up. He's going to pray for us. He's going to pray for our church and for our offering. If you have an offering today, you want to put it in the plates there, you guys go right ahead. Okay. Pray with me if you would. Uh, our Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence, we thank you, Father, for uh, the awesome, great, and wonderful God that you are to us and for the blessings that you give us. Uh, Father, we come today, we want to worship you and we want to praise you. We just want to enjoy you today, and we ask you to come and, and just bless us today with your presence. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for these children, and we thank you for uh, how you're going to mold them and help us, Father, to be good stewards of the responsibility that you give us to pour into those children and teach them about Jesus and, and uh, uh, do our part, Father, that you'd have us to do. Now, take these offerings and these tithes, Father, and multiply them and use them in your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll see you guys next week, okay? You can keep it. You get to keep the ball. Y'all get to keep the ball. Good catch, Faith. Hey, let me invite uh, Bright and Ann and Cooper and Kaylee to the platform today. And um, I tell you what, if you're part of their family, why don't you just come on along with them? And we want to have an opportunity today to recognize Cooper, present him to his church family. I think we got Bryant's side of the family represented here in this service, and Ann's side of the family is coming in the next service. Well, normally we're trying to move our baby dedications all onto covenant days so they can all kind of happen on the same day. Uh, but Ann's got family that's going to be traveling. Her grandparents are going to be traveling for the next seven weeks. So they wouldn't be here when we do that next. And by the time they got back, Cooper would be about grown. <laughs> Somebody's fall. We haven't done this sooner. Am I right? Amen. All right. So, uh, so we're going to present Cooper to you today. And uh, this is Cooper Frederick. And uh, he's, as you can tell, being persecuted by his sister, Kaylee. <laughs> and uh, we love this family, obviously. I know our church family does. We're thankful for them. And, uh, Brian, you know, we talk all the time that this is really not Cooper's dedication. It's really your dedication and Ann's dedication, our family and our church family's dedication. That We want to do all that we can do to point Cooper to the Lord Jesus. And that's a great responsibility that all of us have, both on this platform and off of this platform. That's what we're committed to doing as a church family, to raising those under our care in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. So our hope is in God alone to draw Cooper to himself in salvation and then to use his life for his glory and for his purposes. So let's pray together. Some of you want to come and gather around the Fredericks and those who want to stand, y'all stand together. Let's encircle them today. What's up, my dude? How you doing, man? You looking good. Who's your favorite family member? Go ahead and tell them. Go ahead. Hmm? Who's your favorite guy on staff here? Go ahead. You can tell him. He told me. <laughs> All right. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you so much. You are so good and so faithful. Thank you so much for Cooper. God, thank you that you have created him and formed him. God, thank you that you have a purpose and a plan for his life. And God, that will start with him admitting his need for a Savior, to recognize that you sent Jesus to save him from his sin. Lord, thank you for that, and thank you for the day that will come. We believe in faith and trust that he will trust you to be his Savior and his God. Lord, help uh, our family and our church family uh, to lead him in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Uh, may we always point him to you, and, and when we miss the mark, may we be quick to Teach him what confession and repentance really truly looks like, God. Uh, thank you for a church family like this in which we get to raise our children. What a blessing that is. So, Father, uh, we thank you for Brian and Ann, and we pray you would continue to give them wisdom and grace to be the parents that you've called them to be. 
We thank you also, especially for his big sister Kaylee, for loving him and taking care of him and telling him about Jesus as well. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all this today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right, you guys may be seated. And I have a Bible and certificate for Cooper. We'll hang on to that too for the next hour, okay? Good job, Kaylee Bogues. Awesome. Man, I'm getting some exercise back and forth, back and forth. All right, if you have a Bible today, go to Matthew chapter 5. What are we doing in these D groups? Well, we're studying God's Word together. We're fellowshipping together. We're making disciples anytime, anywhere. On the inside of your worship guide today, you can see this week's study guide for your D groups. You can also see what we're attempting to read this week together. Matthew chapter 6 through 10. That's our five chapters for this week. And I hope that you enjoyed your reading last week. Matthew chapter 1 through 5. And again, jump in these D groups anytime. We'd love for you to be a part of those. I enjoy being a part of mine. Chick-fil-A didn't know what hit them last week. Right after church on Wednesday night, there are five different D groups at Chick-fil-A that night. It was spectacular, great time of fellowship. It was amazing just to hear this roar of Bible study and fellowship taking place over gospel bird and lemonade. That was fantastic. So we're walking our way through the New Testament, and between now and the end of the year, Lord willing, we're going to get through the four Gospels. And we talked about each of those Gospels a a little bit last week, and and kind of why we have four, why there's not one. Um, And I I think really it's because God is painting a portrait of His Son in each of those four in a very unique and a very specific way. We talked last week that Matthew presents Jesus as our promised King. Right? If you didn't write it down last week, here's your chance. You can write it down today. Matthew, he's our promised king. Mark, he's our powerful servant. Luke, he is our perfect man. And John, he's our personal God. Each of those gospel accounts is going to be so sweet and so wonderful for us as we walk through those. And so here we are in Matthew. And last week we looked at the king and his coming. We read of his lineage. We read of his birth. We read of his baptism. We read of the beginning of his ministry. We read of the beginning of his message. Chapter 5. If you read chapter 5 last week, uh, maybe you read that on Friday. You read the beginning of his message that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And so tomorrow we'll be in Matthew chapter 6, which means we're picking up our reading in the middle of the Sermon on the On the Mount, and we're going to continue reading this week through chapter 10. So, last Sunday we looked at our promised king and his coming, and today we want to talk about our promised king and his kingdom. Our promised king and his kingdom. Now, I know we're in church, and so you'd hate probably to confess this, but I'm going to ask you to be honest with me. Is anybody here a fan of the old television show Seinfeld? Me too. Do you remember this episode where George Costanza is kind of coming to the realization that life is not like he ever wanted it to be? I mean, he just kind of feels like a colossal disaster. And he is kind of coming to this conclusion that his, all of his instincts must be terribly flawed And so Costanza makes the decision that from now on, whatever I think I'm going to do, I'm going to do the what? I'm going to do the opposite, right? So instead of ordering the kind of sandwich that he always ordered, he orders a different kind of sandwich. Instead of going to this place that he always went to, he went to this place. When he meets a, a, a young woman that he'd like to go on a date with, instead of trying to tell her he's an architect, instead he says, I live at home with my parents and I mooch off my parents, you know. So that's what he does. And, and so you may remember how that episode goes. And maybe you're wondering, what does George Costanza have to do with Jesus? Well, really nothing at all, <laughs> sadly. But when Jesus came, this promised king that Matthew's talking about here, people found in him as he preached his message about the kingdom of heaven, 
they found his message to be much like the way people today find his message. I mean, really, when you pay attention to what you started reading last week and what you're going to read this week in the Sermon on the Mount, it's likely that you come away from that kind of thinking to yourself, that's impossible. It, it just seems like Jesus is asking way too much of us here. When he came preaching his kingdom, it was a kingdom that, kind of like George Costanza's world, his kingdom seemed to be opposite of everything that would make sense to us naturally. Just think about some of the things that Jesus said. If you want to be a leader, you first got to be a what? A servant. If you want to find your life, you got to lose your life. Instead of hating your enemy, which comes so natural to us, he says, instead, love your enemy. He says, if somebody wants your shirt, give them two of them. That kind of goes opposite of everything that we seem to think. Jesus said, in my kingdom, the first are last, and the last are first. The kingdom of heaven sounds like a kingdom in which everything is opposite, when everything's different. We might even say that the kingdom of heaven sounds like a kingdom that's impossible. It's impossible to live the way that Jesus says we're to be living in his kingdom. Let me ask you a question this morning. What if that's precisely how Jesus wants us to think about his kingdom? What if the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount was not to bring you to a time of invitation that says, now who wants to do it? What if the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount was to bring us to a place that we go, hold up. That's impossible. Because see, really, that's what happened in my life this week as I was studying these five chapters as I came to that realization. And I want to show you that today. That I believe, indeed, the whole reason Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount was not to bring us to a place that we said, oh, I want to do that, but to bring us to a place so that we would say, I can't do that. And so I, I, I've kind of been at a loss to how I'm going to sort of preach through the New Testament with you all as we're reading through that. Our pastors have been kind enough to give me some counsel, but some think I'm crazier than they thought I was even to begin with. And so kind of what I've anticipated doing is that somewhere in the midst of those five chapters, I'll just kind of jump into a paragraph, you know, and we'll just kind of dig out a paragraph because that's really what I, I like to do and enjoy doing that kind of expository sort of preaching. But, but this week, what God did is I began to study really kind of blew my mind because Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7... Sermon on the Mount so rich. I mean, to really preach that well, you could spend over a year easily just preaching that. And then you get into 8, and then you get into 9, and you get into 10. And yet, this week, I believe really in my study time with God, God just kind of gave me one big sermon that covers Matthew 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So we're going to be here a while. I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're going to kind of take a helicopter flyover today of those six chapters of Scripture. We're going to jump back and grab Matthew 5 out of last week's reading. And we're going to go Matthew 6 through 10 all the way through the end of it today. But I want you to see that Jesus is laying out before us here that he is the promised king. And whereas last week we saw the king and his coming, today we're going to see the king and his kingdom. And you may look at that kingdom as a very possible kingdom. Or you may look at that kingdom as a very impossible kingdom. Kingdom. So let's talk about that today. You read last week about his birth and his baptism, the temptations he faced, how he called his first disciples and he began to heal people. And after he started healing people, what happened to the crowds that were following him? They got big. They got big really fast because they'd never seen anybody quite like Jesus before. And so when the crowds got big, Jesus starts to teach them about his kingdom. And that's what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. And in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to lay out for us and for his audience there how citizens of his kingdom are supposed to live. That's important to know, don't you think? If we want to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, then we need to know how the king expects us to live. Because the kingdom of heaven, like any other kingdom, like any other nation, 
has laws and has standards. And Jesus' kingdom is no exception. It has laws, has standards. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out the, the, the constitution, if you will, for his kingdom. Fourteen times in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to say, you've heard it said, but now I say to you, all right? And every time he says that, it's almost like he's saying, you heard the kingdom of heaven standard is here? No, no, I'm telling you, it's way up here. And every time he makes that statement, you've heard it said. Fourteen times he says that. Every time he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you, I kind of go, geez, Louise. Seriously? Because this, this seems impossible. And I think it is. So let me show you. First of all, on your notes, I gave you a bunch of notes today. Did you see that? <clears throat> You're welcome. <laughs> I just thought, man, there's no way we're going to cover so much ground unless you just have it in front of you. So you can go back and look it over later. All right. So first of all, let's look at the king's principles. The king's principles are impossible. The king's principles are impossible. First of all, I want you to see the king calls us to impossible righteousness. He calls us to a righteousness that's impossible. Look at Matthew chapter 5. We're going to skip around. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. And you may want to underline the very first words of Jesus' sermon. Because I think these are the most important words of the next six chapters. Very first words of Jesus here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, how we are citizens, how we're supposed to live as citizens in the kingdom of heaven. So this is an important statement because he said, here's who the kingdom of heaven belongs to. Those who are poor in spirit. We're going to come back around, so hang on. And then he goes on, what we call the Beatitudes. Those who mourn will be comforted. The meek will inherit the earth. Those who hunger for righteousness will be filled. The merciful will be shown mercy. A blessed are the pure in heart. They'll see God. Verse 9, the peacemakers. They'll be called the sons of God. Verse 10, the persecuted. They're persecuted because of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Man, he's talking about being poor in spirit. He's talking about mourning. He's talking about being meek. He's talking about uh, being filled with righteousness, merciful, being pure in heart, being peacemakers, being persecuted. And then skip down to verse 17. He says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone, watch this. See if this doesn't sound like impossible righteousness to you. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, and this is what he expects of citizens in the kingdom of heaven. He says, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments... And teaches others to do the same. Will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now watch verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What are we talking about? We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. All right. We're talking about. Our lives lived inside the kingdom of heaven. What's that supposed to be like? And right out of the gate in the Sermon on the Mount, I'm kind of shaking my head going, seriously, you're calling us to be like that? To have a righteousness like that? That seems impossible to me that we could have that kind of righteousness. But not only does Jesus speak here about this impossible righteousness, but then he moves on, and here's where it really gets tough. Because when we talk about righteousness, that can kind of be sort of vague and, and ambiguous, right? Ne then he moves from talking about impossible righteousness to impossible relationships. <laughs> now Jesus takes the ambiguity of righteousness and says, now this is what it looks like in flesh and blood. This is what it looks like at street level kind of living. And watch this. Think of, think of you, okay? Think of how doable what Jesus is saying is for you. I think it's rather impossible. He begins with the issue of murder. Now, I know we're all thinking, well, I, I've made it this long without killing too many people. You might even say, I've made it this long without killing anybody. So this seems rather possible. But Jesus didn't stop at murder. Look, he said, you've heard it 
You've heard that it's said. Remember that I told you this? Watch this. Every time you hear that, he says, you've heard it said. Here's the standard. He's going to go, boom, but now I say to you, right? So he said, now you've heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Jesus says, in my kingdom, anger's out. Whoa, how you doing so far? <laughs> you, you batting a thousand already, right out of the gate? And we just got up to the plate, man. How you doing? He's calling us to these impossible relationships. He starts there talking about anger, and then he moves talking about adultery. All right, struggle there. I had sex outside marriage. Maybe that's a temptation. Say, so, you know, I can handle that. But then Jesus shows up and he goes, oh, wait a minute. You heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And ladies, we could just flip that around, right? And say, if a lady has thought lustfully about a man, then she's committed adultery in her heart. Hello, how are we doing, church? Jesus says, in my kingdom... Anger's out. In my kingdom, lust is out. Impossible relationships. Then he begins to talk about divorce. It's a whole other issue. Then he moves in verse 33 about keeping your word. In, in, in his kingdom, these things don't exist. We, we live these kind of lives. It seems impossible. He continues on and he speaks about an eye for an eye. You've heard it said, that eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. Hey, I'm good with the kingdom that says the dude smacks you, smack him back. It makes sense to me. But in Jesus' kingdom, he says the guy smacks you, you turn the other cheek. Don't resist an evil person. They strike you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to see you and take your tunic, your coat, let them have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. I mean, I'm going, no, in my kingdom, he ain't forcing me to go nowhere. <laughs> Jesus says, no, you do twice of what he's wanting you to do. Don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus says, in my kingdom, we're going to give it all away. Not in my kingdom. Jesus says, don't turn them away. How, how you doing so far, church? How's life in the kingdom of heaven working out for you? You, you meeting the standards here? Or are you about like old Otis? You about to grab the key and just go put yourself in the jail, right? <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not making it here so far as a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. And then he starts talking about love for your enemies. He said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor. That exists in my kingdom. As long as my neighbor's right and decent, okay, treats me well, I can love my neighbor. But then Jesus shows up and he says, but I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? And watch this, okay? Uh, unless so far you're going, I'm all right. Because then he says, be perfect. Be perfect. As your Father in heaven is perfect. How are we doing? Citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus calls us to impossible righteousness. He calls us to impossible relationships. Then he starts talking about giving to the needy. Help those folks out. So, so far, five through six has all about, been about our relationships with people. What is Jesus saying about our relationships with people? You can write it down. It's real simple. Treat them all right. 
by his definition of right. And his definition of right includes things, crazy things like mercy and grace and forgiveness. And then he moves from impossible relationships with people to impossible relationships with God. He starts talking in chapter 6, verse 5 about prayer. When you pray, notice he says when. He expects the kingdom of heaven to be talking, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven to be talking to our heavenly father. It's just a given. He doesn't say, if the citizens of the kingdom of heaven pray, they're supposed to be praying. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door. And pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. And then He goes on to outline for us what we call the Lord's Prayer. So He's talking about our relationship with God. He moves then from talking about prayer in our relationship with God to talking about fasting. And notice what He says in verse 16. Uh Uh-oh. Hello, Baptist. Are the Baptists still awake this morning? Because verse 16, he says, and when you fast. He doesn't say if you fast. He says when you fast. When you stop eating so that you spend more time saying, Lord, I want more of you. I long for you to come. I want to be with you. He says when you do that. Don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men their fasting. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. In other words, he's saying, look your very best when you fast. Don't fast such a way that you're kind of mope around going, look how spiritual I am. I've done without food. God loves me more than he does you. No. He says, man, you you look sharp as a tack when you're fasting. You're not going to mope around. You only want God to see you. In other words, he's outlining a relationship with God that we only want God to see us in our prayers. We only want God to see us in our fasting. It's a struggle there. Impossible relationships with people. Impossible relationship with God. Now, if if you're thinking you're doing pretty good so far, then he moves, third, to impossible relationships with stuff. He says, don't store it for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up yourselves treasures in heaven. That's what citizens of the kingdom of heaven do. They don't store up stuff on earth. That's not their kingdom. They store up stuff in heaven, not on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How are you doing in terms of relationships with people this morning, according to Jesus? According to Jesus, how are you doing in terms of your relationship with God today? According to Jesus, how are you doing today in terms of your relationship with stuff? He says in verse 24, nobody can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money or stuff. You can't do it. So how are you doing there in terms of relationships with people, relationship with God, relationships with Stuff. He goes on talking about relationship with stuff. He says, don't worry about it. Whoa. He said, I tell you, I tell you, don't worry. Look at verse 25, chapter 6. Don't worry about your life. What you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or about your body or what you'll wear. And be honest, how many of you ladies this morning, you worried a little bit this morning about what you're going to wear? Mm-hmm. How many of you men did too? Don't lie. (laughs) Jesus says, how are you doing in relationship to your stuff? Are you worried about food? You worried about what you're going to drink? You worried about what you're going to wear? You worried about your stuff? He said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they, citizens of the kingdom of heaven? If he takes care of the birds in his kingdom, you don't think he's going to take care of his people? Are you not much more valuable than they? Whom of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? 
See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these. The citizens of another kingdom run after these things. Jesus is saying the citizens of my kingdom, they don't run after those things. How are you doing, church, this morning as citizens of the kingdom of heaven? In terms of your relationship to people, in terms of your relationship to God, in terms of your relationship to stuff, what about in terms of your relationship with yourself? Here's, here's what I mean by that. Chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Don't judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? In other words, how are you doing in terms of relationship to yourself? Are you being honest with yourself today? Are you being real with yourself today? Then I'm really not in a place to call this guy out about his sin because I got sin in my own life I got to deal with first. Are you walking around today honest with yourself that there's stuff in you that's got to be dealt with? You know, I, I'm just kind of realizing more and more the longer I live that there's really only one thing that God wants me to hate with a passion every day of my life, and that's the sin in me. So prone, so quick to hate the sin in everybody else. But first, got to hate the sin in me and deal with that. That's what citizens of the kingdom of heaven do. So how are you doing this morning in terms of your relationships with people and with God and with stuff? with yourself. In other words, God's saying treat people right. In terms of your relationship with God, know Him personally. In terms of stuff, God says don't worry about it. In terms of yourself, God says be real about that plank you got going on. Then He talks about our relationship with faith. Not faith finding, but faith in God. He says in verse 7 of chapter 7, ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And him who knocks the door will be opened. Who is walking around in the kingdom of heaven with that kind of faith today? Anybody? Who's doing that? How are we doing citizens of the kingdom of heaven in terms of your relationship to people, to God, to stuff, to yourself, to faith? And then he begins to talk about false teachers. Citizens of the kingdom of heaven recognize false teachers. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And he goes on talking about that. And then he says, talks about our relationship to obedience. Look at verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Are you kidding me, Jesus? I mean, we're, let's just back it up. We're, we're at 724. And let's go all the way back to the beginning of chapter 5. And Jesus is saying, I expect you to put all this into practice. Impossible. Impossible. Jesus says, verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus is saying your relationship to obedience has got to be on spot. 